Hey Bear, how are you doing? I'm doing better than usual, which is always good. Nice. That's great. <laughs> I'm a bit tired today. I, I don't know. I was all the day, like I woke up and I was, I would like to sleep still five hours, but yeah, you need to go to work and do your things to, to, to live. <laughs> yeah. I, I got aggressively woken up by several cats this morning who were not happy with how much food I left them last night and uh, decided to just purr really loudly and, and in your you know. face or uh, throw stuff on the floor uh, or just uh, start to to open doors so, yeah I feel your pain all of the above yeah yeah <laughs> I feel your pain I I have two cats here so yeah <laughs> mm. they're wonderful but uh... <laughs> yeah. they are bossy you know <laughs> But we they love know what them. they want. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they are clever. Uh, always, I say that the next life, if there is another life, I want to be a cat, a fat mm. one, loved, that have everything that want. <laughs> mm. Th that's the reincarnation. If you did everything right, I, I agree. Pampered house cat is like top form of reincarnation. Yeah. That's true. That's true. <laughs> But let's talk about uh, you and everything you because you you are doing a lot of things and uh, you have your own page when uh, everybody can go and read all your life pretty much. So it's it's re really amazing and uh, I really love how you put your uh, your web page. It was really well put. But uh, let's let's start from the fact that you you are from Canada but you live in Finland. <laughs> so tell us more about, about this change from, from America and Europe. Well, it, it started pretty much just because I was young. I was maybe like, I want to say 21 or 22 when I moved here. It's going to be my 15th anniversary this year. And I... I was just kind of looking down the next 10 years of my life and thinking, hmm, is this okay or is this boring and do I want to try something else first before I maybe settle down with my nice boyfriend and my nice job and all of that? No, I like to live life on hard mode. So I just decided to go to a country that no one goes to where there's only like two other languages that sound anything like it. And I picked Finland specifically because it had a great music scene that Canada is so starved for anything other than like just the basic pop music and even then I'm from Alberta which is just you know kind of hillbilly oil field central it's just farms and oil fields so there's really no music goes there I think um, by 2010 Calgary hit a million people and so some bands now come there sometimes but I just I really wanted to see more live music and Finland was a little cheaper than Norway and I'm a little more into folk and power metal than black metal and church burnings <laughs> yeah yeah That's what I picked Finland and so I came originally as an au pair and I was just supposed to be here for a year but I kind of just liked it and didn't know how difficult it was to be an immigrant so I, I maybe bit off a little more than I could chew but I don't know it's I, I'm making it work somehow <laughs> yeah you know th there are similarity in uh, your story and my when it comes to moving to Finland because okay I moved from Italy so it's not on the other side of, of the world but still uh, and I'm also I always always say that I'm a power metal kid. <laughs> Even if nowadays I'm listening a bit, uh, maybe more on death and uh, uh, death core uh, and something like this. Uh, but still, uh, when the power metal songs start, in particular, you know, the one that I was listening when I was younger, then something, something, some 
you know some fire start and start to burn there and uh, i feel i feel uh, emotional uh, when i listen to song songs that i will, was listening before moving to finland so and also i came as an au, au pair so <laughs> yeah there is this similarity but where are you living uh, in finland i live in the middle of nowhere like up north uh somewhere between Tuzula and Huvinga. okay so but i i have like 10 neighbors there's nobody around basically yeah i have two I neighbors think... but uh, i sh i think that i see them a few times per year so it's perfect <laughs> when i was in italy you know i had always this uh this stress about uh, going home and have to chat with people or take the elevator with people it was so stressing <laughs> <laughs> you must love finland then <laughs> yeah yeah finland is the right place for me <laughs> <laughs> how is the weather there is same as uh... in Pori because here is <laughs> today is a mess uh yes uh, well wednesday came down like uh, 30 centimeters of snow and it was beautiful i was so happy and today start to rain and it's like terrible i i had my my feet complete uh, wet <laughs> it i i really tried my hardest not to leave the house today but i did have to pick my partner up from work and he was sending me messages like be so careful when you're driving it's just raining ice right now <laughs> so it's yeah it's that that perfect nasty consistency where there's like a pellet of snow surrounded by a droplet of water and if your car stops moving for one second it just freezes into ice and then you have no visibility anymore <laughs> and it's just messy but hopefully I don't have to do too much driving this weekend. Yeah, that that's good. That's good. Let's hope that, that, that there is not more driving coming for you. <laughs> but um, how do you feel uh, uh, now that it's been 15 years that you have been living in Finland? Uh, if you could go back in time, would you do this again? Huh, well, I never like to do the same thing twice, so maybe I'd try something different if I had the opportunity, but I would certainly have some advice for myself, <laughs> like, get a real job, uh, don't try and be an artist first, get a real job first, then try and be an artist, once you can support yourself, and uh, practice speaking the language as much as possible. Because I I should be so much better at Finnish than I am after fifteen years. I I'm okay. I'm I'm not going to sell myself short. I'm pretty good. I'll survive. I'll never die because I can't communicate. But I just I'm still one of those foreigners who's just blockily piecing the language together. And I've worked two summers now completely in Finnish without a word of English. And it it doesn't matter. I'm still just terrible. I think it's maybe because people are too nice to tell me how to say things right. They're just like, oh, yes, no, we understood what you were trying to say. That's good enough. And they don't actually tell me what I should be saying. So it's still just this. Yeah, I think that sometimes uh, <laughs> Finnish people are uh, are too polite. Maybe they 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 like they like the, the effort that the foreigner do. But uh, I have uh, nowadays few clients that they correct me because mm -hmm. of the, I told them that uh, uh, when I speak, I I speak quite fluently, but uh, my mouth is more uh, more fast than my brain, mm -hmm. so the words come out, uh, and then I I'm like thinking, oh that's that's wrong, but this happened also with English, so of course it's not my native language, so. Every, but we finish sometimes it pisses me off because there are some mistakes that I have studied the grammar so it should be like easy but still they mm -hmm. come out in 
in the way they want. <laughs> mm. It's it's true because you have to know so many just linguistic nuances that I I remember one time I was trying to say that my shoulder hurts, but then I know that you don't say I'm cold. You say I have cold. So I thought maybe I'm not supposed to say "hartian uh, kipula" or something like that. Maybe I'm. I, I I tried to say "hartialla on kipu," and what the Finns told me is that it sounds like there's a little pain gremlin sitting on my shoulder because the "lla" ending is also on top of. So rather than saying "I have pain," I said "there's a little pain sitting on my shoulder," and I was just like, "Ah!" Oh, now I'm overthinking this. Damn it! <laughs> <laughs> But it's com it's a complex language, so. It's a. Uh, it's not easy, and it's always good when someone makes effort to, to learn the mm. language. Um, you know, when it's not your native language, you are never gonna be like perfect. With time, mm. you get better. But for example, I have this strong accent, and I know that yeah, I can try to work on this. But also, when I speak Italian, I have the accent from my my hometown there so the from the di dialect and yeah it's so strong it's so 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 much into me <laughs> but whatever try to survive <laughs> yeah i think uh people people get too hung up on being perfect when they speak another language and really like i don't think mm almost anyone's language hears someone trying and goes hm, you're not good enough but we all feel insecure like that's what people are thinking and really it's kind of silly i've i've never actually had anyone shame me for not speaking a language well enough except maybe the french but <laughs> that's okay they're known for that that's their thing <laughs> yeah how many languages do you speak mm I would say currently only two because I used to speak French quite fluently, but that was also 20 years ago and I haven't used it since. So I can still understand French pretty well, but I, every time I try and speak it, my brain just processes different language. And so I've forgotten most of the French vocabulary and it'll just input the Finnish word in. And so I just start speaking this awful hybrid language that nobody can understand. So it's best if I don't try and speak French anymore. Yeah, yeah. It's it's not easy. It's not easy to to have uh, many languages uh, in your brain. Mm. <laughs> you, the brain gets confused. But the, it's always good to learn to study languages as well as music for your brain. Mm. Just to, to get your brain uh, training all the time. That's, that's something. Yeah. But uh, you are a writer, and you brought also this Icelands of Night Sea and other things. Um, there were a lot of things, but uh, <laughs> so far, because I think that this is the biggest thing that it t tell us more, because I want to hear from you more about uh, your writing career and what you are writing also right now. Well, it's a fairly long history there because I started writing when I was about 13 years old and it was just something that I think we were supposed to write a poem for school or something like that and most people would write you know like a little haiku or a sonnet or something like that and I ended up writing this ludicrous 14 page rhyming epic and my teachers were just like huh okay she went a little hardcore compared to everyone else and I just realized that okay this is something that kind of comes naturally to me and uh, I noticed as well that I was really drawn to fantasy and I got really obsessed with the legend of Zelda at some point I had a Nintendo 64 and I was playing Ocarina of Time and I just I got really fixated on this fantasy world that I could Go exist in and be a part of and so I started writing a prequel story to it that was called The Four Princesses and it was 
cool i'm not gonna lie for something that like a 13 year old was making i had done like full dungeon designs i had done all of the puzzles i had and i had added a full like king's quest style point and click mechanic into the game as well so i i was really like out there when i was a kid and then i got as far as the uh time skip fire temple and then i got this idea because i was having a really emo long distance uh romance it was my first love and so i was like i'm gonna start writing my own original story that's based on this and it's really just like a cheesy old school final fantasy game and at that point i thought oh maybe i'm gonna like write video game stories i'd love to you know be the writer for the next great final fantasy series or something i even had a dream of um working a bioware uh because they're in canada as far as i know they're in edmonton but uh, when I graduated high school, I thought, oh, this is uh, it's pretty complicated. They need me to learn a whole Neverwinter Nights system, and anything that I submit has to be submitted through Neverwinter Nights. And I'm not a, like, I, I have basic millennial tech skills. I'm not good at them. So that was too much for me. And then after 13 stories in this series, I put the whole thing aside and thought I'm gonna write something that's more me and that story came from the guy I was dating before I moved to Finland his brother and I were discussing one time uh, what our lives would be like if we were in a fantasy story and I've been working on that since 2008 and if I'm really really lucky I'm actually gonna publish the first part of it this year but that's my my soul piece my opus the the story that's been growing with me for almost 20 years now and it's changed as my beliefs have changed and as i've absorbed all these perspectives from all the places i've been and so that's another thing that i've been working on but i don't talk about it so much because i don't want to promise it before i'm yeah. ready to release it and then more recently came in islands of night sea and that spawned oh it was originally supposed to be a team project actually uh the idea was that i came up with this whole universe that i don't remember how i came up with this idea at all but it was this thought of what if the multiverse was real and it broke and i thought it would be so cool because I love stories uh, or shows or anything like Futurama or things like that where anything can happen because it's outer space or whatever or there's magic or things like that. So the Night Sea was this like world where every imaginable thing that you could possibly think of does exist, but they all broke. So now all of existence is a horizon that separates the sky and the night sea and so there are islands that float there that are the shards of broken planets and so any any world that existed in the multiverse may or may not have a remnant that just drifts on this endless horizon and i thought it would be really fun to have a series that uh, kids could grow up with so like you know, Harry Potter back in the day, uh, before <laughs> J.K. Rowling was problematic, uh, you know, kids got to grow up with that and they got to experience things. But what I wanted to do is kind of take it a step further and go really deep into those subjects that make people uncomfortable. So things that are not so like cutesy and fun to write about but that actually have meaning that, that can teach kids real lessons like what does it mean when you swear at someone versus if you just swear as an exclamation or what are topics like sexuality that or uh, sexual awakenings that parents can get really uncomfortable talking about so I wanted to get really deep into what it's actually like to grow up and to do it in this world 
where it's still really fun and exciting, but also where just the fabric of what we understand about society has been pulled apart. Like all of the rules that established world had got destroyed when reality was just completely remade. Like, we as people were very complacent. We don't like change. We get into our habits and we get comfortable and we don't like it when things are shaken up too much. But anyone who survived in this world has had to go through just a complete reckoning. And that's what the uh, the two short stories I've published are about. Um, they're not the children's books. Uh, I maybe made a mistake using my regular artist for the cover of one of them. I think maybe people mistook it for a children's book because the art is very cute, but it's actually a story about the Shatterclism, this event that destroyed the multiverse. And it's really about the grief that people feel and a healer who who's learned how to heal it and how they kind of abuse that person trying to heal themselves not understanding what they're taking from that person and so it's about compassion and understanding and grief and healing and letting go then the second story adrift actually takes place just right after the shatterclism has happened and it stars a dead person and a psychopomp a kind of karen-like figure in in the boat who are on their way to the afterlife and suddenly there's no more afterlife and they don't really know what to do with themselves anymore so they just have to figure it out at that point when you've lost your purpose and your destination what do you do next so still i'm hoping again to get some of the actual kids books released this year but you know struggling artists and funding and all of that stuff yeah it's is... not easy <laughs> slows me down a little bit yeah but yeah you have really interesting topping that you are covering with uh, your mm. your books uh, and uh, so it's uh it's deep and uh, you know uh there is need to talk about deeper topics mm. uh, because i think that uh, even if uh, yeah there are people trying to talk about uh, deeper things. We still live in such a superficial world. Uh, mm. Also, if I think about, I don't know, the s social media, for example, it's um, amazing. Yeah, I, I like it. But at the same time, it makes me mad, you know, uh, seeing just... <laughs> I don't know. I think that uh, on, the, for example, uh, Instagram or TikTok, uh, why those people that are doing nothing uh, interesting get uh, success successful? And I, I still have this question mark. Why? Why people like to watch people uh, like that? I, d I don't know. I don't get it. <laughs> that's That's the big mystery. If someone can write in the comment, then what do you think? Because I don't, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it's it's wild. Like, and part of the thing I've been focusing on since right about November, December of last year is just, you know what? I don't need to reach for audiences that are not going to use the things that I like. You know, I. I can't handle Facebook. I still use it because I was one of the original users back in the day. So at least I'm familiar with it. But all of these new social medias, I'm like, these are honestly really toxic places that are really bad for people like me who probably have ADHD and anything that's like a really fast attention grab I've found has been so harmful to me and just my functionality that I've had to start limiting my phone time and really like self-regulating how much time I spend online just for my own mental health. And I'm really sensitive. So I don't like all the negativity that gets thrown around. Yeah, I think no. Instagram's not too bad on that front, but you still get some pretty obnoxious, terrible people out there who are yeah. just mean for no reason. And I don't like it. So 
I, I'd love if I could get through life without social media, but it seems kind of necessary these days. So at least I'm going to pick the ones that I like and go with that. Yeah, true. That's true. But uh, now let's talk about your podcast uh, because uh, you have this podcast called The Gathering of the Geeks. Am I mm -hmm. am I saying right the, the word the geeks? Is geeks or yeah. geeks? Gathering of geeks. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes I have those uh, those words that I'm like, how they how they are. <laughs> but yeah. So you are interviewing people or you are meeting and chatting with people uh, from the metal scene uh, mm. and uh, talking about uh, all the games uh, and other things. Everything that is uh, beside music. Uh, so tell tell us more about uh, about it well i used to run a music media starting in i think 2012 was when i took over it was called musicalypse.net and it was i think in its prime back when the people who owned it before me had it it was probably i don't know if it was the only english language magazine in finland but had a huge following they had interviews with like slayer and mayhem and like lots of the big names back then so i took that over and i got really into music journalism for a while sadly kind of uh distracted me from the creative writing unfortunately but i digress um it wasn't until i think 2013 that i started kind of dipping my toes into doing interviews But back then, you didn't have as much freedom to talk about whatever you wanted with people. You always kind of had to keep it on the subject of music and their career. And eventually, when I started doing these album release interviews, I got so bored so quickly because the unfortunate thing about album release interviews is that they're always kind of going to be the same. Like, people are always asking... You know, what was the process like to make this one? How is this different from the last one? Tell me about these songs and what do they mean? And kind of no matter how good of an interviewer you are, it always ends up being a little bit generic. And I got bored of that. And I could start to feel that some of the people that I was interviewing were just like, yeah, mm -hmm, here's all of the things that I've already told everyone else. And like... I felt like I was wasting their time, even though they wanted the interviews. And another thing I noticed is just that part of the reason I liked Finland so much was that I was able to find so many more people who liked the things that I like. And I think maybe it has something to do with the love of the forest here that maybe means people are really more interested in fantasy and stuff like that. I don't really know where it stems from, but one way or the other, there's just a lot of people who loved geek culture here. And so originally the series was supposed to be for Music Ellipse, and I merged with Duo and Ella magazine, and uh, after the merge, I think we just both had a lot going on, and I started to think maybe I didn't want to limit myself just to musicians, and so I opened it up to uh, any artist, essentially, who considers themselves a geek. And then that way it was something for my own website. And that was, I think, maybe even why I put my website together was just to have somewhere to talk about that. But it's been really fun. Uh, as you said, I've started mostly with uh, metal musicians and every single episode is different, which is so much fun. You know, the first episode talks a lot about horror films. The second one, action figures. The third one is uh, comic books. And all the way to later where uh, we start talking about like growing up as geeks and like what it's like being bullied or not having friends or things like that. And what's also maybe something that geeks and metalheads have in common is that they were often kind of the kids who didn't have so many friends growing up that didn't want to follow the popular normal or, or things like that. And so it was really easy for me to find people to talk to for the podcast. Like even without looking at bigger artists outside of Finland, like Lacuna Coil, who are 
very geeky. Yeah. Uh, there's yeah. tons of people in Finland that I could talk to. And so it's been really, really fun. Yeah. Yeah. I think I feel a bit like you, you know, because I have been doing interview for 10 years now since I moved to Finland. And still I'm doing interview for the web signs sometimes here and there. But then I start to thinking about this this metal pizza just to talk about also other things, not to stay on the basic 15 minutes maximum of interview because it doesn't feel like real. And I feel mm. I feel that sometimes artists need to to express themselves more talking about other things uh, uh, to show who they are because yeah. Uh, yeah they are doing music but every person is so different and every person has his own story and everyone has an amazing story to to tell so i i like to to listen to to people and to open also not only to musician but everyone that is involved in the in the in the metal world in the community because uh, there are a lot of people that are doing uh, so many things so why just uh, get on a, you know on one way when you can have much more mm. it's true and if you think about the audience as well like for anyone who has fans the fans are going to look for whatever they can find and if all they find is the same thing over and over, that gets boring. Maybe they'll stop watching interviews because they're all the same. And so that's why I wanted, again, to to just give people an opportunity to talk about something else. And that's why whenever I pitch it to bands, I always want to say, like, I'm not trying to be a media. This is not an interview. I'm not going to necessarily ask you anything about your band unless you want me to. I want to just talk to you as a person about the things you like that inspire you, that interest you. And, you know, if that goes into music, great. But otherwise, like, let's explore a different side of you as an artist and like how this stuff makes you who you are. And to me, that's so much more interesting than what was the process behind making your newest album. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, true. That's true. Yeah, but uh, you also have this uh, out of record and uh, mm. off the record interviews, mm. and uh, they are more. Uh, we were talking that the normal, uh, you know, interviews get in like fifteen minutes, but you have a longer interview. You have a good chat with uh, with the artist. Tell tell more about. Uh, about about it because last interview was uh, Alta Mula Road mm. then yeah. was uh, Marco Yetala yes yeah. yeah that was um it was basically because of the Marco Yetala interview um one of the things one of the many many things that I do is occasionally sell merch for some bands and so I happened to be selling merch on Marco Yetala's springtime tour of last year and he's such an easygoing guy. So I thought like, hey, if you feel up for it, like totally up to you, but if you're up for it, uh, let's do an interview and just chat about where you're at these days and what's going on with you since your hiatus. And he was like, yeah, for sure, let's do it. So we did this great interview and I didn't really have a plan for it. I thought maybe I'd give it to Tuonela, but then uh, it got forgotten in someone's inbox for like four months or something. And then I kind of remembered it. I was like, oh, what happened to that interview? And then uh, Laureline from Tuonela said that, oh, you know, like, consider publishing it yourself. Like, it's it's a little like past due for, you know, Tuonela is very good at keeping things really relevant. So I think they'd have wanted to publish it while it was still, uh, while the tour was still going on. And so I, I was listening through it and I was like, you know, I don't really ask him anything really specific. It's just that I'm very familiar with his career. So I had just a lot of kind of random personal questions, like, you know, not like personal, but, you know, just like, what was it like performing with Arion and, and things like that, that he does a lot of really interesting stuff and I just wanted to ask about. And 
so I started to think for a while, how could I, how could I frame this and make this fun? Like what, what kind of series could I do with that? And I came up with this concept of off the record because, you know, like back in the day when interviews were extremely serious and you had to fact check everything and confirm every single thing before it was published. Anytime someone would say something a little personal, they would say, please keep this off the record. But then for me, off the record means this is specifically not talking about your new album release. So there's the kind of wordplay double meaning there for yeah. let's let's not ask those questions. Let's do something else. So his is the first one. And then uh, Ultima and Road is the second one. Sonata Arctica is going to be the third one. But then those are the bigger names. I also wanted to dedicate a lot of this to the indie artists that I've started seeing because I've I'm someone who likes different things all the time. And when you've been doing metal journalism for so many years, I kind of feel like I've seen it all. And so I wanted to try something a little new and I ended up just going to see a random friend performing. And I had such a great time that now I just, I bounce around to indie shows all the time and I meet these wonderful, interesting people who are very different from, I don't want to say like famous, but like established artists. There's a very different vibe there and it's really wholesome and it's really warm and welcoming. Everyone really appreciates each other. Everyone shouts each other out. Um, like most of how I'm finding music right now is just anytime one of the artists I follow shouts out another artist, I'll put them on my to listen list. And anytime I go see a show, I make sure I go in time to see everyone who's playing, not just the one I'm familiar with. And I'm finding so much cool stuff that I never expected. Like I found this guy named Heiki Hanninen who does like this old country blues kind of stuff that, you know, I grew up with that in Canada. So I love that and I never thought I'd hear it in Finland, but here I am at a pub on Iso Robert in Kato in Helsinki listening to this guy playing, you know, I put a spell on you and stuff like that. It was just amazing. Or the uh, the Helsinki Psych Fest is another one. It It is Psych Fest, but it, the Love Potion Club and the Love Potion Psych Fest I think they're pretty loose on what qualifies as psych because, you know, it's not all psy trance. There's a lot of just rock and prog and things like that. Yeah. Um, so I love going to Helsinki Psych Fest and Love Potion Club. There's always something new. Uh, Joja and Friends, uh, Johanna von Herzen, she organizes a lot of music. All of her stuff is really fun. She's a great performer. So there's so much fun stuff i don't even know what i'm talking about anymore i'm just rambling <laughs> yeah, but oh, the it's, interviews. it's, it's, it's yeah. really great that to you know because yeah um metal is something that i love and that you love and uh, i think most people that are going to watch this episode of metal pizza love <laughs> otherwise <laughs> they are not watching maybe but yeah <laughs> um <laughs> But it's important to be open-minded and, uh, yeah, th th there are so many interesting artists that are not from the metal scene that deserve mm. to be uh, seen and uh, listened to. And when mm. you go to see live uh, gigs, you know, there are always surprises. Uh, I, you know, most of the gigs that I'm going to see are uh, underground band and, uh, there is a from rock to to extreme metal uh, and and every year i get to know new bands and meet new people and it's so beautiful and well living close to pori then there is uh, the jet culture because for the pori yachts <laughs> so it's it's something big sometimes you get to to place when they are playing some jets or some blues and then uh, i have a friends that organize underground uh, uh, parties uh, about 
house and techno uh, or other electronic stuff that I I know nothing about pretty much, <laughs> but I'm going there and to see sometimes there are pl people playing for you. And I remember one, one guy from Turku, I think that is from Turku and it was amazing. And I saw him two times live because it's so good. Uh, the, the gigs are so, so fun. So yeah, it's important to, to enjoy the music and uh, mm. And not to be too, you know, too picky. Yeah, I think I always shout out this show. I think it was in June or July of last summer because it was, it was right at that point where I was feeling really bored with everything, and I had, I think I was just kind of running around town like a chicken with its head cut off, and I had been visiting my friend who sells merch for Battle Beast. So I went to the Battle Beast show and then I looked at the clock and I thought, if I haul my ass right now, I can get from, what was it, Katayanokka over to Sörnainen, where uh, Frozen Factory were playing at Lepakomies. And I hadn't seen them before. So they have this wonderful guitarist named Zolt. I'm not going to try and pronounce his last name. Um, I see him around all the time. He has a very distinctive look with a curly mustache and two colored hair. He plays in Dream Tale and After Infinity. He's in a few bands. Hey. Um, and he had a guitar solo coming up in the last song. And he was, his, uh, the battery for whatever was connecting his guitar to the amp, uh, the Bluetooth had died. And so he was fumbling with the cords trying to plug it in and he knew it wasn't going to happen by the time he got to the solo so he just fuck it grabbed the mic and started singing his solo like me, 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 <laughs> into the mic <laughs> and i my whole face exploded into this huge dumb grin because nothing seems to now bring me more joy than the weird quirks of small shows you know, when bands get so big, they're so polished. Um, Sabaton's a really good example of this, that I used to love seeing Sabaton in clubs, but, like, nowadays, Joachim says the exact same song jokes at every uh, show, and it's it's really scripted, and back in the clubs, he'd be goofing around and making fun of the crowd and things like that, and you know, of course, I appreciate the big production and all of that, but eh, I don't know. I'm not uh, so interested. In... I'd, I'd rather just see the weird, quirky one-on-one -on -one stuff where you really get to be with your audience and and things like that. Even even just like Guy Hachto's uh, solo drum show recently. Like, what a cool experience. Just do you ever get to see the drummer front and center with no one else or you know when does the drummer really ever get the spotlight it was yeah. so cool yeah it's it's great now i was thinking about the drummer and i remember that uh, at the time when there was a finnish metal expo in helsinki there was there, there was this um, a, a battle of drummers. So young uh, young drummers were there doing this battle. Oh, it was so interesting! And there were the live interview with uh, Jonne Nicola. I remember uh, Alexi Laio, Marco Yetala doing the interview. Of, uh, that was the year that I went. I think that was twenty ten because they had a a some sort of a special thing with the drummers there was a drummer signing session i think yeah yaska from bodom was there as well and i have a lot of weird fun memories from yeah that. yeah i was there too i was on holiday i was not living here yet but i try before moving i try always to come when there was some big uh, festival or things like this so i was just <laughs> going around around finland pretty much <laughs> but mm -hmm. the finnish metal expo i i went three times and after that uh, it failed i think i don't know what happened but it was a sad moment yeah i think they they weren't making enough money to keep going or something yeah. like that yeah mm. pretty sad but 
she taught them. <laughs> yeah, but it's interesting to see how much thing like what survives and what dies here because I think only maybe two of the metal bars that were open when I moved here are still around I think On the Rocks and Tavastia are the only two that are left yeah I remember going to when I was on holiday going to Perkele Klubi that, no story yeah no. So there, there were also it's not only in Helsinki but also here in Pori they, there is not a rock bar anymore. There were two plus one that was doing a gig, so not only metal, but at least two times per month, there were some medium-sized bands come to play. And now it's, uh, th there is just this um, Meara Clubby. They are organizing uh, those metal gigs. And thanks of God there is, or thanks to them, <laughs> <laughs> that they are uh, doing this uh, because otherwise I will be like uh, depressed <laughs> like or deeply but... poor because you have to spend all your money going to another city for yeah the that's that's a big problem <laughs> but uh, talking about um, music since you are a voice actor you have been in a force measure me measure am I pronouncing right the, the name of the <laughs> just force major yeah it's just uh, it comes from french so it's yeah. spelled that way <laughs> so you are uh, the voice in uh, the darkening song mm. so how, yeah. how did you end up to work with them or in the album <laughs> i think their drummer is one of the first people i ever met in finland and it was like i was kind of casually seeing this Finn Swede guy who lives in Hamburg and he had a German friend who was friends with their drummer and so she like just set us up on like a friend date I guess it was at some point I don't even remember how we met but uh that guy actually ended up introducing me to my partner that I've been with for 15 years now and uh yeah so I think they were just looking for someone who spoke English natively and you know I've I've got a fairly deep talking voice but it's always been flexible I think like one of my innate skills is just being able to change my voice and mimic others like a parrot so you know speaking with other accents is usually not that hard for me once you know someone teaches me how to do it and so they wanted me to just put on this kind of childlike voice and read this kind of haunting little piece. It would, didn't take too long, I think. We only did maybe about six or so takes of it, but it was fun. I would I would love to do more of that, but I have absolutely no idea where to advertise myself. So well, maybe I need to any, sell a fiber If page. anyone uh, that is in a band and needs someone uh, is watching, they can contact you. <laughs> yeah but let's go to the question because there was a, que a question left from Anna Brödel uh, how does it feel to live in a house under the rule of several cute fluffy cat beasties <laughs> oh my goodness what a question I'll bring out one of my friends come here oh, come here oh. this He's is my friend Teddy is a boy is it a boy <laughs> yeah they're all boys we didn't want any gender quarrels when we had our kitties so also uh, we um, we've fostered all of our cats for a breeder which means uh they're all rag dolls and they they're a very floppy type of cat this one is kind of the bane of my existence because he wakes out at about eight o'clock every morning and is full of energy and <laughs> you can see the floppiness here. That yeah. <laughs> he's just absolutely gone completely limp. And he, he comes into the bedroom and he starts banging on the knockers on the furniture and I don't sleep great. I 
after 6 a.m if something wakes me up i'm probably again that kind of adhd brain is like oh hello we're awake now let's go and so because of you i don't get enough sleep you fluffy monster <laughs> um generally speaking i do love having four cats i treat them like people which some people might think makes me insane but it's good to have company because my partner works away from home a lot of the time so i would get very bored and lonely living in the middle of nowhere with no social life if i didn't have all these cats even if my floors are constantly disgusting four is a little bit too many i'd say three is a good good limit yeah i have two and uh, you know they start around the well it depends you know cats are night night creatures so uh during the weekends it, it, it is fine because we go to sleep quite late but during the week uh, they are such assholes really <laughs> they they are just picking on each other and then uh, at four they start to scream for food and uh, i have one that is a big boy because he's uh, um 11 kilos good god and uh this beast is only seven yeah that that that, that is a also it's a oriental long hair so you you have yeah. this small head triangle <laughs> head and he has this big body <laughs> and it's it's so absurd to watch that cat but he's so fun he's fun <laughs> <laughs> and cats are fun they they are they, they 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 are just so much fun <laughs> you can uh, get mad with them but then you are always going to cuddle with them they are just <laughs> they are just the queen and kings on this world <laughs> yeah we have the fun thing about our house is that because of the breeder we've had so many cats come and go uh, we fostered a litter one time, we adopted one of the kittens, and we've just had this, if I were to write it down, it would sound like Game of Thrones. You know, our oldest cat, Simon, he's the king, undisputed. Other cats see him and bow in his presence. Like, they they back down, like, you know how, like, sumo wrestlers, a lot of the stomping they do is to intimidate their opponent. He he does that just with his his look. He gives this sort of like hmm, and and the other cats are just like okay, don't mess with him. He's in charge around here. He's the boss, <laughs> and, and and everything just falls in line around that. So we have the king, we have the queen, we have the biological prince. Uh, Big Teddy is from Belgium, so you know he's not. He wasn't welcome at first, but okay. uh, sadly, Prince Reinhardt uh, did not survive past four months. Again, all of the Game of Thrones drama is extremely. <laughs> I I should really write that someday, just because it's, it's a great it's a idea. Story. <laughs> it's a great idea. Yeah, a game of cats. <laughs> yeah. Throne of Cats? I'm not sure. Yeah, nice, nice. <laughs> now you get a new idea of mm. what to do next, what to write <laughs> next. But how did you get into metal music? I, I, I'm curious. That was very much a right time and right place thing. Uh, I was, I believe, in grade six, so I would have been about 12 or 13 years old. And I was just starting to realize that all of the pop music I listened to was kind of the same and didn't actually reflect any of my life experiences. And then I was, my brother was giving me a ride somewhere in his old Ford Explorer with a mixtape in the deck. <laughs> and there was this cool song playing and I was listening to the lyrics and it was like, Huh, fly on your wings like an eagle. Fly as high, touch the sun on your way like an eagle. And I was like, man, as the sun breaks across the sky, an old man's... This sounds like the story of Icarus. 
and I just so happened to be studying Greek mythology in school at the time. And I was really into it because, you know, I'm a fantasy geek. So anything with like pantheons and gods and stuff like that, I was eating up like candy. And so this Iron Maiden song was, it just broke my mind. Like, oh my God, someone writes music that's not dumb love songs? Boom. <laughs> and I do, give me this mixtape this is the most precious thing I've ever experienced and I became just the hugest Iron Maiden geek you cannot imagine the insane collection of everything that I had this was before you know merch was a thing so yeah. anything I could get my grubby little paws on I would take and <laughs> Oh, man. Yeah, I had a reputation back in Hillbilly, Canada as being like the biggest Iron Maiden fan in the country or something like that. Wow. <laughs> and, and then it just kind of snowballed from there. Some of my first loves were Nightwish, Blind Guardian, Halloween. And uh, it was kind of the folk metal that lured me over to Finland, which came a bit later. That was, you know, around 2000 three or four that I started to get into that and I really found my my true love in Turisus <laughs> sad story oh, yeah. wherever they went yeah. but yeah. um I I had this dream after all of the metal I had been listening to what would my dream band be and uh, first of all it had to have a good violinist because I grew up playing violin so I needed something that was kind of special to me and I wanted a singer who could both sing and growl. And I was looking for this deep voice with a kind of Wolverine smooth purr to it. That was Matthias Nugord and Oli Vanska. <laughs> like just yeah. everything my brain had imagined, those first three albums of theirs at least was just, oh, that's, thank you. Thank you for taking my dreams and making it reality. <laughs> and yeah. it was... It was that documentary, A Finnish Summer with Turisus, that I love was, that. That was really what drew me here. What was that, 2008 or seven that that came out and I moved to Finland in 2009? Yeah. So, yeah, I think maybe 2008. I don't know. Uh, Nettaskeg was, uh, was not even 18 years old, so it was before 2000. I don't remember. Is she from eighty eight or eighty nine, mm -hmm. or maybe ninety? But she was she was sixteen, I think. So yeah, mm -hmm. it it may maybe it was two thousand seven or two thousand eight. Must have been two thousand eight because two thousand seven was when the Varangian. No, that's this, the Varangian Way. Yeah, it came out in two thousand seven, and she was not on that album. I think that was still Lisko. So she joined a little bit after. But yeah, so it was really, it was right before I moved here. I think it was probably one of the most instrumental things that I was like, man, look at all those festivals and all that nature. This is great. I want to go there. Yeah, it was a really a beautiful documentary. <laughs> it's one <laughs> of those that uh, for who is a big fan of uh, um, Finnish metal music uh, and it's it's like a dream, you know. Mm. It's it's yeah. I remember when I came to one of my holiday out of the DVD. Every time that I came to Finland, I get back to Italy with like ten uh, albums so, <laughs> or a DVD and stuff like this. Yeah, I was just giving my money, like <laughs> fans needs to do. <laughs> yeah. I have so much merch. It's insane. <laughs> yeah. but what's your favorite band, if you have one? Oh, well, my favorite band for the longest time was Ember Falls, but they called it quits last year, so I don't know if I can count them anymore. Uh, but my new favorite, who have kind of stepped into their shoes, are Merta, whose shirt I'm wearing now. And nice. Uh, yeah. ironically I first heard about them when they were playing a show with Ember Falls but I didn't actually listen to them <laughs> until what last November I think they played 
they opened for Machine Supremacy, who's one of my very favorites. Yeah. And it was they're they're hard to pair because you know Machine Supremacy has got a very like niche sound and audience, and so it's hard to put a band with them. And Merta was probably the best I've seen, and I think their singer said the same that they were probably the best musical match for them that they had ever had. Maybe that wasn't you know Urizen or. Horizon. They're American. I shouldn't pronounce that the Finnish way. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so I've really been enjoying their music, and I think they have a new album coming out April? April 12th? I think. I'm really excited for it. I haven't yeah, heard it yet. Nice. Let's wait for their new album. Yes. Yeah. I'm glad that they like me, though, because I should be selling merch for them, too, so... It's always good when the bands that I like like me and want to work with yeah, me too. It's the best thing. <laughs> yeah. But now let's get to my jar, the jar of a random topic, and Ooh. let's see what we are going to get from this this time. I feel this this cars. So you were talking that you were driving today. So what car do you do you have? Ooh, I have a. I want to say 2015 Mazda 3. Okay. What color? It's silver. Nice. Light but... silver. Not my favorite, but not my least favorite either. What will be your favorite color for a car? Ooh. I just like anything that's different and non-standard. So, I, you know, those those weird ones that shift in the light or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> Or maybe just a really bright teal. I'm not sure. Just yeah. I, I guess like most cars come in like white, black, silver, red, uh, and the, maybe the a couple color. others. Yeah. 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 So. Yesterday, yesterday yes. I saw this um, Porsche, a new model of electric Porsche, and it it has this uh, dark, uh, deep, um, forest color. It was so different. So you were, I, mm. I was like, wow, that's interesting. <laughs> And uh, I think, do you have a favorite car? The dark green, uh, oh, what is it called? The Cooper Mini, the the new new age Cooper Minis. Yeah. I was always a big yeah. fan of, I think, the Italian Job remake, which came out in something like 2004 or five, which was basically an ad for the new Cooper Minis. Yeah. And I always yeah. just, I am not an offensive driver but an assertive driver and so i i'm i love driving i'm very in tune with my cars i feel like they're an extension of my body and so i feel like i would really love driving the little like go car and <laughs> go kart car that uh, yeah. i'm also i'm very short so I have always gotten teased for needing a mini car anyways so now, i figure now i, might have I want to know how short you are I'm 160 centimeters. Well, you are way taller than me. I'm 147. <laughs> so Ooh. I'm 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 on the on the more short <laughs> side. <laughs> well, the real question though is are your feet smaller than mine because I have insanely tiny feet. Mm. I am a 36, which is I believe two sizes above children's shoes in Finland. <laughs> I have a 37, so I have a bi <laughs> bigger feet than you. Uh, but people say always that I have also bigger hands. I have big hands, or not big, big, but they are they are not the small. Oh, yours is a small one. It's a cute one. Tiny hands. Uh, and I, I don't know, maybe I was supposed to be taller, but... <laughs> I don't know what happened. <laughs> no, I was not supposed. The doctor said that uh, the maximum would have been uh, 152. So, yeah. Mm. But so I have still time to grow. Isn't it like this? Mm. <laughs> but, but you must understand the, uh, the old uh, front row frustration that if you can't get up close to the front, you can't see anything it shows. Yeah. Yeah. And also I'm, I'm not that kind of, you know, the sweet kind girl no i'm just i remember in italy <laughs> for uh, it was uh, children of bodom gig there were those tall dude 
with long curly hair. Then they <laughs> they just walk in front of me and my friend. And then I was like, now I'm just to rip their hair. So I put my arms up and then I put my finger in their hair. And, um, and all the time I was like this, because you have to suffer if you don't respect me. <laughs> Well, if you if you don't respect the, the other people, then I may become a bit of aggressive, but not too much. I'm still kind of. Mm. <laughs> now everybody's scared to see me at gigs because I can be aggressive. I mean, I do understand. I, I confess to in the past that if someone who's like way taller than me comes and stands right in front of me and just starts moshing, I might just raise the horns and let their hair tangle on my hands and let them rip their own hair out just because, wow. you know, it's, I understand the desire to be up front, but a little bit of spatial awareness and respect for the small people yeah. out there would be yeah. appreciated. Like, I don't think one or two meters really matters if it's a matter of being polite to other people and letting them see the show that they paid to come see. You know, it came in my mind uh, last summer at Tusca for uh, Lorna Shore, and uh, then I tried to get not to, not close in the in, in in the first row, but there was a a part when it was like I can see something, and there was two girl like this, and then I was uh, is this taken? Uh, yeah it's taken and then i was i hope that uh, they are not all people no they are not and then there was those men uh, 180 what the fuck i was so mad with them i Ugh. but i behave <laughs> i i kind of behave i don't know maybe i a bit uh, <laughs> i just a bit uh, eat uh, the their back and sometimes they were looking <laughs> it makes uh -huh. me mad. Uh, let's pick another. Another. All thing. right. We we went uh, from cards to our uh, <laughs> our eight and uh, feet and uh, hands. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to take this because we talked before. It, it's it's so social media, and for some mm. reason, I pick this a lot. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> Can can we have something something else something more more juicy? Let's <laughs> see some juice tattoos and piercing. So, do you have any tattoo or piercing? Ooh, I have exactly zero piercings. <sighs> How many tattoos do I have? Well, there's technically two here, I suppose. There's a Devon Townsend project and. The moth is from Swallow the Sun, but that's not actually why I got it. I got it because I like the design. And I was looking for a moth tattoo uh, as a sort of spiritual ward against a phobia I developed as a teenager. Hey. Um, there's uh, two over here, technically, again. Uh, the one on the outside is actually... I have a deal that anyone who recognizes that I'll buy them a drink because it's a very obscure Nightwish tattoo. Um, hmm. The the cross is because I used to be a Christian and uh, the wings come from a poster for Ghost Love Score and it's the pattern that's drawn on this woman's dress. And... Um, the, the sort of meaning there. And this is really ironic because I did this back in, I want to say about 2010, which was way before Thomas Holopine and had the big like, I'm an atheist now thing. So it was just kind of ironic that he had done the design that represented the same thing, this kind of freedom from the chains of religion. Uh, let's see, I have my dragon on my back which is a slightly customized version of blind guardians fly dragon and that song is self-explanatory it's about fantasy and inspiration and creativity so um but it was kind of funny that the um uh the the center i got the image off the disc from the fly single and the center was missing and i had to really look to find the full design and I didn't like it 
it was it's a very beautiful kind of tribal dragon but the center is kind of blocky yeah and the uh, tattoo artist did like a custom design for the center to make it suit the whole thing a bit better I'm not going to show it off it's really ugly he did a bad job and it, it was done in 2005 um let's see I've got my Halloween guy on my leg he's upside down but that's from the dark ride I don't like it it's gonna get covered with the Dark Souls bonfire yeah. um I, I've always kind of known like I, I I go with vibes for my tattoos a lot and I wanted it about this big and on my foot and so I shouldn't have taken it if it wasn't going to be what I wanted so that was my mistake I'm hoping that I'll get to keep kind of the the face part of it hidden in the bonfire so that there's some of it still left but yeah and then down here it's probably very hard to see but it is a kraken that's uh destroying a ship and yeah. it's covering not completely i decided not to completely cover it but my first ever tattoo which read the textbooks and it was uh some friends from high school it was their band name and it it represented a time in my life that um I was very much coming into myself like I had thought that you know screw the popular people why would I want to be friends with a bunch of judgmental assholes uh I'm gonna be my own weird self and anyone who wants to hang out with me can do that and these guys from school had this kind of fun weird band and just through being our own weird selves we ended up making friends with them by the end of the year despite not being cool and so the getting their band name tattooed was kind of representative of coming into myself in high school and so i i kind of got bored of the tattoo after 10 years or so and i thought i'll cover it but not completely and the kraken destroying the ship is kind of dual meaning for overcoming your fears because apart from moths my other kind of big fear is black water and I have I didn't know I had asthma until like three years ago so I always used to have genuine panic attacks when I was in water because I didn't breathe very well and I also went swimming in lakes a lot as kids so uh these pike fish you know I saw one once that was truly about this big around. It was like two meters long. It was a prehistoric monster. So <laughs> things below me in a place where I tend to panic are just too scary. So much like the moth, this was a, a ward against my fears. But it's also about overcoming your fears. And, you know, don't let that ship cross through your waters if you don't want it to. Take it down if you need to. Yeah. Um, do I have any more? No, I'm I'm right about seven years behind in tattoos. I do have a new one coming on my forearm that my lovely friends helped me fund for my last birthday. So uh, hopefully this spring I'm going to get that one. And <laughs> It's a really obscure character from a Dungeons and Dragons actual play <laughs> called Dimension 20. Yeah. Uh, it's from fantasy high season two sophomore year character named Gardy o'brien who is a pirate brothel owner and <laughs> happens to be the most uh accurate depiction of who i want to be <laughs> that i've ever seen in anything ever so <laughs> my my dream version of me is that character and so i thought yeah. i need i need them on my forearm smoking a hookah and blowing the smoke up and then the upper oh, arm will be all of my influences so you know like some characters from spirited spirited away and kingdom hearts and final fantasy and zelda and all of these things that just brought me joy and helped me become who i am yeah they are part of you yeah mm. But it's nice, you know, it was uh, even more nice that you had the story about your tattoos. <laughs> because uh, 
for example, I have just two for the moment, but I I always want to get something that have you know something that has a meaning for me. Uh, mm. Not just uh, the drawing. I want. I want that there is something that uh, tells something about myself, mm. and uh, or that is important for me. So, I always find this really interesting what people uh, have to say about their tattoos. And uh, mm. then there are a lot of people that uh, don't. They don't have story about their tattoos, and it's mm. fine. It's. It's it's fine if you like just the the piece of art because it's art, and uh, you know I'm I always look like amazed when the, there are certain tattoos that are like wow <laughs> next level how how is it possible to to draw something like this you think <laughs> on the on a person in particular on a human canava <laughs> it's it's really really amazing and I I also am. It's been a while that I have been thinking to take uh, in here. I want, actually, I want to one year and one year uh, about songs. <laughs> the, the, there are songs. One is from Sonata Artica. Mm -hmm. And I like, I like uh, the how, how it sounds because it's, uh, it's what it is about music. And Music for me is one of the most important things. So uh, I I want to have something about music. And then here is from a Italian singer. And it's also how I love the song and I like how it's put in the the, the, the music. M music is the only reason why I know time still exists. Mm -hmm. So it's uh yeah i think that that's that's something that i want to have but then there is all the the style i have the ideas in my mind how i want those because i don't want just that it's right written there i want that there is some drawings uh, that explain more or less what's going on but let's see at some point at some point maybe I was thinking maybe this year, but it seems that this year there is other other things to, <laughs> to spend the money on. So maybe next year, let's see. Yeah, poor starving people. Just uh, it's it's a shame that we can't have all the tattoos we dream of because we have to do things like eat and yeah. keep our houses warm. Never in the winter. a joy. <laughs> It's so unfair. <laughs> First world problems we have. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to cry in a corner right now. <laughs> yes. Wipe my tears with my cats. <laughs> my designer cat. <laughs> yeah, but um, beside these uh, things, uh, now it's, I'm just thinking where I put stuff. <laughs> it's, it's a mess, this table. Gladly no one is seeing my table because I have to, I was supposed to, to, to paint the table uh, before New Year, but then uh, life happened and uh, yeah, maybe I was a bit lazy. So maybe <laughs> maybe tomorrow I'm going to take all the stuff off and then I can put also the new microphone that I got. So the interview maybe is getting better also. Trying to improve for everybody. <laughs> but uh, let's get to the to the main topic uh, of this uh, this podcast uh, talk show, whatever you want to call it. <gasps> uh, it's pizza. So do you like pizza? I confess that I do in fact enjoy pizza and I eat probably too much of it in, in honor of this podcast tonight I had pizza for dinner great <laughs> so what's your favorite pizza ah see you're asking me to pick favorites again and I never do that but some of my favorites are um there's one combo that I love that's very Finnish. It's uh, 
smoked like ground reindeer meat with goat cheese and arugula. Mm -hmm. Also a big fan of any pizza that's uh, got barbecue sauce and uh, chicken usually paired with like onion or bacon or red pepper or something like that. It's always good. And if we're being just plain and basic, a good ham pineapple with or without blue cheese. I'll take it either way. So you are on the pineapple side. Uh, that's the only thing where I'll eat baked pineapple. You can't put it on my burgers. You can't put it on any other pizza. Just that, just with ham, nothing else. <laughs> Okay, so you are specific on on the pineapple. <laughs> mm. Any all this pineapple and tuna shit people are talking about? No, that's weird. <laughs> <laughs> What's he, what is your opinion? Because lately I have been talking with a guest about this uh, peach thing on pizza. What do you think about peach on pizza? I would try it. I'm deeply suspicious. <laughs> There's a thing that I didn't know was real until my first love told me that he found it at a restaurant in my hometown that was pizza pie. And it was like a legitimate North American pan pizza. But, and it's, I think it still had cheese, but then it was fruit. And... So it was like half pizza and half pie. And I remember, I don't even remember, I didn't dislike it when I ate it. It was just fucking weird. <laughs> the, I bet it, that, that's, that's something weird. You know, as an Italian... One of them was uh, cherries? Yeah. As an Italian, I think... Uh, yeah. <laughs> Fruits on the pizza are not a thing. Um, mm. Also, maybe you know, it's not just about uh, pizza, but uh, in general, I don't like sweet and salty together. Mm. So that's something that the, my brain cannot understand, <laughs> or my my tongue. I don't I don't know which one is deciding. <laughs> So it's a, a big no. But, you know, in Italy, there is this um, dessert pizza, the Nutella pizza. And it's <laughs> it's basically the just the pizza, the bread, uh, and the pizza dough, and uh, then the Nutella, and then some, some whipped cream. That's it. Oh, who is, who is this cat? His name was originally Bowser, but I think his name is just Bean now. <laughs> so beautiful. <laughs> Little Beans. <laughs> the scruffy house baby. But, yeah, a, dessert pizza is just... It's. I think a lot of pizza dough is inherently kind of the same thing as a baguette. So I suppose it's not that weird you can have nutella on a baguette that's not such a jump away from nutella on toast but still the idea is my brain is really suspicious like <laughs> no 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 you're trying to I, trick me into something here. i think you have to go to italy and try one of those mm. And they are not big like normal pizza because it's too much. <laughs> let's let's say that the Nutella is a lot, so let's not not have too much. <laughs> but yeah, uh, where did you eat the, the best pizza in your ever in your life? Who? What's the best pizza I've ever had? There was. Hmm. Let's say the uh oh, what is it called? There's a place in Turku that does I think kind of like 
I'm not going to say like classic Italian stone oven, but for sure classic stone oven style pizzas, uh, but with a Finnish kind of twist. So they, they just use kind of local ingredients, um, you know, like salmon or something like that. And I don't remember what kind of pizza I had there, but I remember the quality was spectacular. Only I could remember the name of the place. <laughs> but... Yeah. And then again, there was also a, a place in Tambre that um, had a really good, I don't remember, it was something like chicken and cheddar and maybe some onion and arugula that I remember was really great. But if I'm being generic, uh, if you are from Canada, there's a pizza chain called Panago that have a just straight up barbecue chicken pizza that's my favorite thing <laughs> it's dirty delicious <laughs> and uh, where did you eat the worst one? Oh, almost any pizza place in Finland <laughs> just generic like the really really crappy uh, pizza places in Finland I think there used to be one where I used to live called Star Pizza, and there's a lot of Star Pizzas around, but this one used, like, just the worst quality ingredients and used too much of them. So you would get, like, this terrible rubbery cheese, and then there would be, like, a centimeter thick layer of it, so your whole pizza just tasted like rubber and grease. And then it was always like, I, I hate canned vegetables on pizza. They always are just so much worse than fresh vegetables. So always like the paprika was slimy and yeah. I will not eat canned mushrooms. They're disgusting. <laughs> so I'm a bit of a fussy eater. I won't deny. But yeah, most most like greasy generic pizzas in Finland are pretty bad. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I can agree. I can agree on that. <laughs> Taste some and uh, yeah. It must be hard to come here from Italy and eat pizza. Yeah, yeah, but you know, <laughs> here and there you can find good place. Uh, I In Helsinki last summer I went to um, Via Tribunari and it was amazing. Uh, here in Pori there are two pizzeria that they are doing great so yeah it's not well via tribunali was uh yeah italian pizza <laughs> but uh, here in pori there is still some work to do but quite good quite good i'm not complaining <laughs> <laughs> also sometimes i like to go to Coti pizza so. I I used to like Coti pizza, but they've just gotten too expensive. They're not quite good enough to they, justify the They are price. expensive, uh, but you know there was uh, uh, during this summer I saw, yeah, during the summer I saw in the in a store that um, there were p sold out pizza and like uh, um, from the freezer, like frozen pizza, and. <laughs> They were sold out and the price was like eight euros per pizza. What's wrong with people? What they are paying for something frozen that that high price? Mm. But I remember when the cheapest pizza, Coti pizza, was still like seven, six euros or something like that. And now the cheapest is twelve, I wanna say. Yeah. So I think I think knowing what the price used to be makes it hurt more to buy it especially like there's a place in Yarvenpa called Rosé um, and they do probably the closest thing I can find in Finland to like a North American style pan pizza and I, I, I do like my thicker crust I, I'm fine with thin crust but I grew up with thick crust so it's what I'm used to and they they have a really good they'll do my my smoked reindeer meat pizza really well and the the basic ham and pineapple is also about as close to the home nostalgia as i'll get so i'll take it yeah 
it's you know every time that you have you taste something that reminds you to your childhood uh to your younger self something that you grow up with it's mm -hmm. it's always you know something it's it's special it it's like yeah this is my thing and maybe mm -hmm. other people are not going to understand what why you are so much in that thing but <laughs> It's like it's like this. Every everyone has its own own thing, and um, sometimes I think uh, about uh, uh, cer certain products that I cannot find in Finland, and I was uh, I'm always like, oh, I would like now to have this cheese, or I would like to have uh, this certain snack because mm. of her. Of course, unhealthy things are always good. <laughs> And then I, I don't have it. I have to wait or to ask someone if can send me a bit. But yeah, normally I'm not asking anyone to send me nothing. So I wait to go there and not take many things with me. So I can put, I can um, spend money on food pretty much, and then I get that everything in Finland. Yeah. Yeah, my my biggest weakness, like I can't do the cheese here. I I need my cheddar. I desperately need it. And the price on this block of cheese that is about this big has risen so devastatingly. I think it's almost eight euros for this little piece of cheese at this point. But I cannot live without it. I'm one of those people that they say microdoses cheese. Like my go-to snack is just a slice of cheese. So I I can't. I need to. It's the one thing I really let myself spend money on. And in those sweet moments where I do have some extra coins to spend, I like to order cheese from Henry Willig in the Netherlands because they have little like cheese wheels that are this big that. I don't know, they cost like 10 to 15 euros and they're really good. And if you visit Amsterdam, you can sample them all at their shop and decide what's your favorite. And mm, cheese. Cheese. <laughs> cheese is important. Uh, yeah. You know, um, my favorite cheese is an Italian cheese that you cannot find in Finland because it's a fresh, it's a fresh cheese. And it's the name is Stracchino and mm. uh, is what i like also on my pizza stracchino and olives that's like the best uh black olives not green never green on the pizza <laughs> <laughs> and uh stracchino is um it's fresh it's uh, a soft cheese but with a good kind of strong taste and uh, it's it's something that I miss, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but let's get to the question that the previous guest left for you. So, ah, yes. The question is, what do you think about Tom Waits? If you know you what know, Waits is. I just kind of discovered him I've only heard one or two songs, but one of them has this insane name, like Tootie Ma is a real fine thing or something like that. And he's got this like Louis Armstrong on acid voice that I'm completely fascinated by. And I'd, I've been taking singing lessons just for fun the last few years. And I, I think I need to go like try and sing some of his songs just because it's just my brain can't wrap around it. I'm I'm in that preliminary phase of being really fascinated by something. I just don't know enough of his music to get into it. <laughs> yeah, but it was nice that you know because the, my previous guest was. Uh, let's hope that this that the next guest know. Who, who who is so it was nice but now it's your yeah. turn to leave a question for the next oh i was gonna try and come up with something really poignant but now i want to ask something silly like 
have you heard of classless act and if not why not <laughs> because that's totally someone's fault <laughs> nice yes i just i i I'd like an excuse to shout them out if, if merda are my finnish favorite then classless act are my american favorite i don't like a lot of american bands so you know there's something special there if i'm shouting yeah. out the americans <laughs> let's let's see what the next guest will answer also i don't remember who is going to be the next because i didn't wrote down i have still to fix <laughs> to fix the next the next one um i have two two guests maybe three coming but uh, i have to to confirm that yeah at that day and that time is going to be okay <laughs> and uh, honestly arranging guests is my least favorite part about podcasting i just i want to talk to everyone i don't want to make schedules and i really don't want to edit afterwards i just want to talk to people <laughs> yeah that's true that's true it's it's not easy it's not easy <laughs> but um We are at the end of uh, this episode of Metal Pizza. So thank you so much for being my guest. It was really a pleasure. So there are a lot of interesting story and I hope that people enjoy it. Uh, would you like to say something to, to the people that are watching or listening to this episode? Well, thank you so much for having me. This was really fun and it was something different for me to do. And I love doing different things. So this is great. Um, What would I say? Uh, if you like weird stuff, I guess come check out my website. It's just bearwiseman.com. And if I told you what was on there, I'd be here all night. So check it out. Listen to more metal pizza and go support your local bands. <laughs> yeah. See your you local so stuff in bars and pubs. <laughs> yeah. Important to support local bands. We need, we need to support those uh, upcoming bands because without support they cannot get through so let's mm. let's keep going to the gigs and buy merch and so on and mm. meet people because this is something beautiful to do yes and i guess if uh, you like live music uh, come buy merta shirts for me in april enjoy nice. their tour it's going to be fun yeah <laughs> thank you All right, thank you.